Welcome to K-Drama School. I'm your host, Grace Jung, and class is now in session. my mistake i was too hasty during my monitoring of the episode which i try to do um every time i upload something but last week i was short on time and i didn't so my apologies that's been uh resolved i re-edited the whole thing and i re-uploaded it like the other night so uh youtube spotify itunes wherever you get it it should be uh, in working order now. I have a show on December 10th at El Cid in Los Angeles. It's at 8 p.m. It should be a really good time, so please come through. You could check my Instagram or Twitter for information, Grace Jung Comedy. You can also go to gracejungcomedy.com for information on the location and tickets and where to find me, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, that should be happening Saturday, December 10th. I've been finding quite a few dramas that I haven't seen just yet, like shows that I've missed because primarily I've been covering shows that I find on Netflix or shows that have been like off people's radar for many years now. But I decided to look at some of the shows that are uh, uploaded and streaming on other platforms like Vicky and what have you. And those shows are pretty fascinating so I've been catching up on those and I should be releasing some episodes covering that very soon so I'm excited be excited for that and of course if you guys have a show that you would like for me to cover just send me your recommendations you could just email them kdramaschool at gmail.com Today I'm going to be covering the show Under the Queen's Umbrella which is a TVN drama that came out these last few weeks, the series finale ended yesterday, and it is a saguk, a period piece, but it is a fictional drama, so it's not based on any real king or queen who had lived. It is just sort of generally based sometime during the Chosun dynasty. That's what it looks like. And it is a saguk, but it is quite progressive in terms of feminist and liberal ideals, uh, especially considering the very heavily patriarchal society that these figures are living in. And in a kingdom, that patriarchal burden is all the more intense. You can see that based on how the concubines treat one another, there is sort of this ranking that they get if they give birth to a son and they have a prince because a prince is a potential heir to the throne. Oh, speaking of the throne. Okay, so when I was watching this drama, I was thinking a lot about the crown and how this show is making attempts at emulating the crown in some way. For instance, the song that this show uses in the under the queen's umbrella you have this uh it's like a classical piece but it sounds so much like the soundtrack the original soundtrack from season one of the crown so there's this song on the crown that's used over and over again if you've seen the crown you've heard this tune multiple times it's been on since season one and it constantly gets used when they're trying to like make some riveting moment you know where the throne is really putting it's like not only just about the ego of whichever royal person that's considered but it's also like look at the magnitude of the crown like what a heavy burden the crown is but what a profound symbol it is blah 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 and this song it's called duck shoot and it was composed by rupert gregson williams If you look it up online or on Spotify, you can find it and you can hear this tune and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It sounds identical to the tune that they use in Under the Queen's Umbrella. 
And honestly, when I noticed that, I was like, wait, this is this is way too close. Like, this is way too close of a use of the melody. It's like, hello? No, you don't... You don't steal something that's, like, so obviously there. You know? Like, how do I put this? Even, even like, I talked about this when I was covering the Silent Sea, but the composer, like, stole a lot of sounds from, like, Hans Zimmer you know, is it Hans Zimmer or Hans Zimmerman? You know, the, the composer, like the famous composer, I think it's Hans Zimmerman, but he composed like all the soundtracks for like Interstellar, like, like Christopher Nolan movies, you know, The Dark Knight, you know, like he's like, when you hear his tune, you just know that it's him. It's like very much like their signature thing. So I was like, why would you steal something that is like, so, you know, essential to the crown like I don't know that bugged me it always bugs me when Korean dramas can't be original you know but other than that like this show does have a lot of originality like this sort of campy you know female rivalry tension thing that's going on but also the women are kind of like self-aware and feminist and they have this collective ideal as well about like womanhood and empowerment and shit like that there is a trans person on this show the for instance like the queen she has a son who is a trans woman and the way that the queen treats her trans female son is very progressive you know, like she she understands her need to be feminine and gives her son like all the permission to pursue that feminine identity as much as she needs. And even the way that the caddy concubines address this trans prince is fascinating. They say she is a woman in the body of a man. Like, that's how they describe this prince. And I was like, oh, that's actually quite subversive because they're not saying like, oh, like he's crazy or he's this. Like, they don't pathologize him. They know that this is a touchy topic and they know that it's an issue that will cause scandal. That they that they know. But the way that they describe her, you know, as a woman in a man's body, I was like, that's very progressive and subversive. Kim Hye-su is an immensely talented actress. From my youth, I remember her playing like this femme fatale or really great beauty or like this really sexy woman, you know? Like she, Kim Hye-su was the actress with sex appeal in the late 80s, all through the 90s. And she's now this like very well-seasoned actress who is more than just a pretty face. You know, she has so much strength in her performance and it's really awesome to see her go head to head with another veteran actress like Kim Hisuk. you know, she's the one that played the Queen Dowager and I was just like, oh, these two, these two going at it, like that's divine. The actor who plays Prince Seungnam was so interesting to me because this actor, uh, Moon Sangmin, he's a newcomer. And he's not a very obvious choice, not for me at least, because like he's not that interesting looking. Like he doesn't seem like a good actor. In fact, his acting was very bland in the beginning. He's not particularly good looking. That's just my taste, you know? I mean, if you're into his looks, like more power to you. He's just not my type. I don't see any history of him being a K-pop star. I could be wrong, but not from what I've read about him. he uh, He's not like an idol or anything. So he doesn't have a uh, fame that he's carrying over from other, other things. So I'm just like, what's with this guy? Why is he positioned as the next big star? And towards the end of the drama, I kind of understood why, you know, like he actually has a kind of a sexy voice. Yeah. I think voice is very important for an actor, a male actor. Yeah, you gotta have a sexy voice. I'm into that. And I was like, oh, okay, he has like a nice register. (laughs) 
like in terms of his voice. Uh, his acting improved, I think, as the series progressed. I don't think he's like a particularly, you know, uh, how do I say? talented actor like I think he's somebody that's still beginning like like okay he's kind of like Swingy Gyo like when Swingy Gyo first started as an actress oh my god she was terrible she was awful oh she was terrible but as time progressed like with each new show that she did you could see her acting improve like you could just see the mileages you know and now I think she's immensely talented actually I think she's very very gifted but I would not have said that about her 20 years ago. So what I'm saying is with this dude, with Moon Sang-min, I think in the next drama that I see, he's probably going to be better. The next film I see, he'll probably be better. I think I think there's a lot of room for growth in his performance. And yeah, like I'll bet you we're going to see him in a lot more dramas. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, welcome to the scene, Moon Sang-min. I guess that's what I want to say. The storyline in The Queen's Umbrella wasn't particularly strong for me. The way that the queen is always a couple of steps ahead of her enemies, like, that eventually became a bit of a predictable formula for me. So I was just like, okay, like, I'm getting kind of bored at times, you know? But I thought it was interesting how the concubines have this comp competition with one another, uh, in terms of like how they're going to raise their sons and how their sons need to like, you know, outcompete the other through smarts or intellect or da da da. Like this whole like parental ego thing that is influencing their children, right? Like this is a concept that we've seen in plenty of other mom dramas, you know, like Sky Castle being one example. The actress who plays consort Kui In Huang, she impressed me perhaps the most. Uh, this actress's name is. And I haven't seen her in anything else. Like, I don't think she's been in the scene for very long. I would say, like, perhaps in the last five years, she's been showing up in some supporting roles in, like, film and television. But yeah, I, I haven't seen her a great deal of her. So I thought this actress was quite impressive, actually. I thought her performance was really good. And I would like to see more of her. And I'm sure I will. You know, she has a great face and she has a really excellent presence on screen. So that's my coverage of The Queen's Umbrella. And you guys, I don't know, but I, I guess one thing I'll share just from discussions that I've had this evening. I was talking to somebody and he asked me, like, what, where and how does stand-up comedy overlap with academia? And I was just like, they're not different. To me, they're the same because... A comedian's job is to complain, you know? They complain about, like, oh, like, why is this like this, you know? Uh, an academic's job is also essentially to complain, you know? Criticism, being critical, right? I guess a nicer way to put it is that both the comic and the scholar are always questioning things. They question everything. Why does this have to be like this? Why isn't it like that? What's with this stuff? What is the historical cause of this? Like, how did this come to be? And why is this still this way when it's not working for everybody or there's a better system, blah, blah, blah. And I feel like both parties do the exact same thing. So, yeah, that was like an interesting conclusion that I came to this evening. I, I, I appreciated the question. Like, he asked me this question and that was the answer that I had. And I liked the answer. So I guess I'm sharing it with you now. Yeah, I'll see you all next week.